Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 119, A Christmas Cup of Chicken Soup, Part 2. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Bedlin. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we open up the ornament box, decorate the tree again, settle in for another serving of chicken soup and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. If you didn't listen to part one last Christmas, here's a recap of that introduction. Back in the early 90s, when I first turned pro, I was playing for the Hershey Bears in the American Hockey League. I was spending a lot of time on a bus, traveling around the East Coast, both in the U.S. and Canada. The longest trips we had were from Hershey, Pennsylvania to Hamilton, Ontario. Ten plus hours each way because of food stops and our driver getting a break from time to time. A marathon, and that's if the weather was good. You can only watch so many movies, play cards, and eat sunflower seeds, or sleep so much. So reading became something I did off and on on every trip to help make the time go by quicker. I was into James Patterson and Stephen King, but ended up not liking the way I felt after a while. Too much blood and guts, I guess. So I ended up starting to read self-help books. I was on the road somewhere and was killing some time in a Barnes and Noble and noticed out of the corner of my eye a new book launch display and went over to take a look. The title of the book instantly grabbed my attention. Chicken Soup for the Soul by Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen. So I picked a copy off the rack and sat down in a nearby chair for a little preview. If you've never heard of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series, they're a collection of inspirational true stories about ordinary people's lives. It's been over a decade since I've read one, which prompted me to do a quick search to see if they'd come out with a Christmas version. Sure enough, there it was. A Chicken Soup for the Soul Christmas. Maybe you'll be in the car driving over to a family or friend's house for some holiday cheer or Christmas celebration. Let me help you occupy that drive time by serving up a number of short stories from a chicken soup for the soul, Christmas, which I hope will make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside by the time you get to your destination. With that being said, let's begin. Story number one, The Christmas Bagel by Barbara Pusha. The first time I celebrated Christmas, I was 29. That's the year I met my husband, Mark, and traveled to Maryland to visit his family for the holidays. I'm Jewish, but I thought I understood Christmas. I had visited Rockefeller Center many times to see the Christmas tree, watched the skaters laughing and slipping on the ice below, smelled chestnuts roasting, or listened to the jangling bells on horse-drawn buggies in Central Park. And who could miss Santa at Macy's? the stores brimming over with toys, carolers singing holiday cheer. When I was growing up, Christmas filled our neighborhood. Christmas Day, the kids came out with enormous grins, boasting about new skates, bikes, and Monopoly sets. Nevertheless, I didn't really understand Christmas until that year with Mark's family. His siblings traveled from east and west for a heartwarming tradition that whittled away the year's separation. I marveled at the tree, brushing the ceiling with homemade ornaments, stockings hanging over a roaring fire, and green and red sugar cookies disappearing in the twinkle of an eye. Like a kid in a candy shop, I sniffed the balsamic air, sipped eggnog with cinnamon and nutmeg, 
laughed at family stories I've heard a hundred times, and watched the family open presents all wrapped in pretty bows. Christmas filled the house with so much joy, and I felt I discovered a special new world. But I still maintained my Jewish heritage with resolve. After all, I had Hanukkah with dreidels, menorahs, gold coins, potato latzkas, and best of all, my family. That second year, Mark and I celebrated Christmas in his tiny studio in Brooklyn Heights. We bought a tabletop Christmas tree. What else would fit in an apartment the size of a postage stamp? After setting it up, we left in search for our first decorations. Unbelievable, I said, spying an ornament in a local card shop. It's a little transparent bulb with a plastic bagel inside, suspended on a little red bow. Mark laughed. <laughs> Perfect. We'll put it on the tree. On the top, I exclaimed. Instead of a star, it will represent the merging of our lives. Sure, Mark muttered. Whatever you say, dear. Amazing how he knew just the right words, and we weren't even married yet. That bagel adorned the top of our little tree and continued to do so throughout the years of our engagement, marriage, and birth of our two wonderful children, Sarah and Natalie. In fact, our children, who celebrated both Christian and Jewish holidays, accepted that ornament as naturally as a cat drinks milk. They didn't know any better until one day when Sarah came home from school in December with a class assignment. We have to bring in a holiday memento that's special to our family, she said, with a worried look on her face. And tell why it's special. What should I bring? Why, the bagel ornament, of course, I said without hesitation. It's been in our family for over ten years. Are you sure, she asked? What should I say about it? You can describe how Mommy is Jewish and Daddy is Christian and how it's a symbol of how we celebrate and honor our differences. Say that again, she said. Together we wrote it down and practiced it. I was overjoyed to share our family's diversity with her second grade class. No one, I was sure, possessed a memento quite as unique as ours. I couldn't wait for Sarah to return home. She did, crying. Mommy, how could you? She sputtered with tears and a runny nose. I was so embarrassed. Why, I asked. Because people put stars and angels on top of a Christmas tree, not bagels, she said. But that's what makes our tree special. But I don't want to be special. I just want to be normal like everybody else. Oh, honey, I said, when you're older, you'll understand. From now on, we'll keep our bagel ornament our own little secret. I don't want it, she said. I want a star on top of the tree. Okay, we'll put a star on top, and we'll put the bagel somewhere else on the tree. No, she insisted. No bagel. That was going too far. Eventually, we compromised. We hid the bagel behind some thick needles and then covered it with garland and a colored ball. It was barely visible. Since then, we've added ornaments to our growing collection, and every year, I ask the same question. Where shall we put the bagel? At first, it moved from its hiding place to a visible spot at the bottom of the tree. Eventually, it inched its way back up, branch by branch, until one year, Sarah allowed me to place it just below the star at the top. Then, things changed drastically. Sarah and Natalie decided they wanted to decorate the tree by themselves. No adults needed. They were teenagers and had to prove their independence. I left them alone with hooks and boxes of ornaments and then crept out of the room with a bittersweet mix of emotions. My grown-up girls didn't need me anymore, but they learned to love and treasure our family traditions. In fact, they spent their own money to buy gifts for family and friends, wrap them up without help, and place them under the tree with pride. Despite numerous attempts to pass through the family room on the pretense of some important errand, my daughters confined me to the kitchen until they were done. When I was allowed to go back in, the eight-foot tree sparkled with festive lights, garland, colored balls, and a hundred family ornaments. And there, at the very top of the tree, sat the little plastic bagel in its cracked, transparent ball suspended by its tatted red ribbon. How do you like the tree? they asked, with smiles lighting up their faces. I answered them, silently, as a tear rolled down my cheek. By Barbara Pusha. Thank you, Barbara, for that awesome family tradition. 
Story number two, A Holiday to Remember, by Denise Peebles. It was Christmas 1991, and I was worried about the impact the holidays would have on my parents. The year had been tough on them, beginning with an accident that required both to have surgery and ending with their home burning down on November 5th. The Thanksgiving holiday was hard on everyone, and I was doing my part to plan a special Christmas gathering filled with happiness instead of sorrow. My sister Diane and I planned every moment as if it was the first time we spent the holidays together. The dinner would be prepared by us to give my mom a break from the turmoil. She and my father had been placed in temporary housing while their home was being rebuilt. Personal items were few and far between, so any effort to prepare a meal would have been a difficult task. Since the tree my mom had used at Christmas was destroyed in the fire, I made arrangements to purchase a smaller tabletop version. I brought it to the house and decorated it with lights and ornaments. A small star was placed on top by the grandchildren, just as it was done on the larger Christmas tree each Christmas Eve. The tree soon became the centerpiece as packages surrounded its base and ribbons sparkled with reflections from the lights. The small home my parents occupied soon filled with laughter as everyone arrived. The dinner was placed on the table and we gathered together to say thanks for all we had shared the past year. We rejoiced at our triumphs and shed a tear or two over the challenges that life lay in our path. But we were thankful that it wasn't worse and felt blessed to be together for another Christmas. After we ate, it was time to open the presents. This was the favorite part for the children. The smiles on their faces grew large and their eyes opened wider at each gift that was passed toward their direction. They wasted no time tearing into the huge bows placed on top to see what surprise was underneath. Everyone seemed pleased with their gifts and were busy sharing with each other. My mother disappeared from the room and came back with two smaller boxes wrapped in identical paper. Attached to each package was a card addressed to the recipient. One package was for me and the other belonged to my sister. We were told to read the card first, so we carefully opened it to reveal the message inside. We wanted to give you something special this year. With money being a problem, we took our wedding rings and had them melted down to make these. The stones in each came from my engagement ring and the gold from both wedding bands. May the love bonded in these rings be passed on to you and your future generations. Mom and Dad. Inside the packages were the most beautiful, identical rings we had ever seen. I felt numb as I looked into the loving eyes of my parents sitting beside me. Although they were given tough obstacles to overcome, my parents wanted to give something special and filled with love to their children. Nothing could have been more perfect. I still feel special whenever I think of that Christmas and the tradition it created. I have the ring they gave me, and someday I will pass it on to my daughter along with the story behind the precious gift. I want her to share with me the feeling of receiving a special gift of cherished memories. Thank you, Denise Peebles. Story number three, The Twelve Years of Christmas, by Jeff S. Hamilton. Since he successfully grew apples, crab apples, and raspberries in the backyard of his Edmonton, Alberta home, my grandfather, Stan Grandish, began to look for advice on how to successfully grow a pear tree. The general consensus was that the growing season in Alberta would be too short, and for three long years, it appeared the naysayers would be right. Undaunted, Grandpa continued to nurture and care for his pride and joy. In early fall of 1985, he triumphantly harvested three tiny pears from the otherwise barren tree and proudly proclaimed his experiment a success. As it often does in the prairies, winter hit hard and early that year, so Grandpa gave his tree only a passing glance as he returned home on December 20th with my grandmother Mary. He thought he saw something in the tree, but it was dark and cold, so he decided to wait until morning to check it out. The next morning, Grandpa looked out the kitchen window and could hardly believe his eyes. 
There in his tree were three large pears and a bird. Hurriedly, donning his winter boots and coat, he waded through two feet deep snow, returned to show Mary his prizes. Each pear was handmade from cloth and had no tags or labels. The bird, clearly a partridge, had been created by a skilled craftsperson from satin. They could find no clue to their origin. The pears and the partridge clearly paralleled the medieval Christmas carol, The Twelve Days of Christmas, and Grandpa thought it must be a joke around his great enthusiasm over the paltry offerings of his pear tree. He and Grandma found great pleasure in sharing their humorous story with family and friends for the rest of the holiday season. Despite their best efforts, the source of the gift remained a mystery. The following year, Grandpa was surprised to receive a package wrapped in plain brown paper with an illegible return address. Inside were two ceramic turtle doves. Suddenly, there was a connection to the pears and partridge received last year. Rushing downstairs, they pulled the previous year's joke out of storage. The spark that danced in Grandpa's eyes as he considered this mystery was a joy for all of us to watch. There was nothing Grandpa loved more than to solve a puzzle or outwit an opponent, and he remained confident in his ability to solve this riddle. The next year, the mystery took on an international twist. Three handcrafted satin hens arrived from Nice, France. The return address was handwritten, so Grandpa did his best to collect handwriting specimens of everyone he knew to compare. But alas, that holiday season also passed without a solution to the mystery. And so it continued year after year. In 1988, four stuffed calling birds arrived by parcel post. There was no return address, but the postmark indicated it had been sent from within Canada. On Christmas Eve of 1989, my grandparents received a call from the bus depot that a package was waiting for pickup. To their great surprise, just arrived by Greyhound from Mundare, Alberta, were five rings of sausage, each carefully wrapped in gold foil and arranged in a picnic basket. By now, my grandparents look forward each year with great anticipation to see if another 12 days of Christmas gift would arrive. And they were not alone. As news of the gentle, creative prank became public, more and more media attention became centered on my grandparents. They regularly conducted television and radio interviews across Canada and as far away as San Diego and London, England. Articles appeared regularly in local Alberta newspapers and national magazines. The year 1990 brought more international flair. Six white satin geese laying arrived from Spielberg, Germany, each complete with egg and nest. The following year brought seven silver-plated napkin rings shaped like swans from Cottesloe, Austria. While my grandparents had a wide circle of friends and family, they had no connection whatsoever with these foreign locations. In 1992, my grandparents received perhaps their favorite gift of all. Courtesy of an old McDonald in Wildwood, Alberta, Canada Post delivered a very large box containing eight wooden maids milking eight plastic cows. Each maid had a tiny crank that moved her arm in a milking motion. Predictability Wildwood, Alberta by an amused Bell Canada directory assistance operator. Nine ladies dancing came in the form of ballerina figurines mailed from Henrietta, New York, and in 1994, ten old-fashioned wooden Lords of Leaping were received from Waterloo, Ontario. They actually more closely resembled traditional toy soldiers, but by pulling a string, the arms and legs would fling up and down, mimicking a leap quite effectively. The next year, eleven Piper's Piping arrived from Bergdorf, Switzerland. There were still no clues to this long-running mystery, but my grandparents were hopeful that the twelfth and final year's gift would also include a solution. Finally, the song came to an end in 1996 as twelve wax and plastic angels drumming arrived from New Orleans by parcel delivery. Along with this final gift was a poem. 
Ho, 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 Stan and Mary. Santa Claus makes his list. Checks it every day. Mystery, surprise, laughter. Don't give it away. It's a secret. What do you say? Question mark. The next year, on December 10th, 1997, a card adorned with American postage stamps mysteriously arrived in their mailbox. On the card were messages and greetings from 10 different people, each in their own handwriting and each from the destination corresponding with the origin of the gifts. This was perhaps the most mysterious of all, as my grandparents did not recognize even a single name. Several reporters also examined the card and were successful in contacting some of the people, but they all said they had taken an oath of silence and refused to reveal the secret. It appeared that the mystery would remain forever unsolved. Then, in the summer of 1999, Grandpa suffered a serious stroke, and for the next several months, his health was precarious. During this time, Grandpa's weariness only seemed to brighten when the unsolved Christmas mystery was discussed. Meanwhile, the now famous 18-year-old pear tree began to wither and die. By spring, Grandpa's health had improved, and he had regained enough strength to cut down his beloved old pear tree. And then, on Father's Day, he finally got his wish. His youngest brother Marshall and his wife revealed that they had been the masterminds behind the long-running mystery. They explained that it had originally started as a gentle prank about Grandpa's dubious pear-growing attempts. When they witnessed the joy that the mystery gave him, they were compelled to carry it on year after year. To do this over the years had required enormous creativity and planning, and Marshall and Twyla had enlisted the help of many others throughout the world to help them carry on their loving gift of holiday joy and mystery. Thank you, Jeff S. Hamilton, for that story. And our last holiday story. Story number four, The Christmas Tree Kitty, by H.M. Forrest. My five-year-old son came running frantically into the kitchen. I can't find Zorro, Mommy. I dropped my dish towel to help in the search. Zorro was an indoor-only cat and did not know how to fend for himself. Together, my son and I made a thorough search of the house, but still no Zorro. As my son grew closer to tears and I edged toward his earlier panic mode, I remembered that we had decorated for Christmas the night before, then dashed into the living room to check as I followed him. Sure enough, we found a very sleek and elegant black and white gift underneath the tree. His green eyes blinked up at us with a look that could only be described as pure rapture. My son petted him happily, and we were relieved that the crisis was over for the moment. Despite all the colorful Christmas toys and stocking stuffers that our kitties received each year, Christmas for Zorro wasn't about the wrappings and tinsel, expensive presents and fancy feasts. It was about the artificial tree. That year, I put away the tree a few weeks after Christmas, and I learned just how important our little tree had become to Zorro. After my son and I removed all the ornaments, we started to unfasten the branches. A restless Zorro seemed to guess what we were doing, and he laid down on the tree skirt, latching onto it with his claws and giving me the most pitiful look I had ever seen. I could almost hear his desperate pleas in my mind as he begged me silently with his eyes not to take away his Christmas present. I wondered how it must seem to him to think he had been blessed with such a wonderful toy only to have it snatched away just a few weeks later. We were moving that year, though, and I had no choice but to take down the tree. When it came time to put away the last fixture, the soft tree skirt, I attempted to distract the rather morose cat with one of his favorite toys. It didn't work. He simply lay there and stared at me. Then I tried calling him from the kitchen while shaking his favorite treat bag, a treat that always worked. It seemed he wasn't hungry for any treats that day, as he held his ground fiercely. Finally, I was forced to remove him physically from the red fabric. A dance of wills that left me struggling for breath and Zorro's claws eventually extracted from his beloved tree skirt. 
quickly hiding it in the box where it would be stored. I dusted off my hands, relieved that I had accomplished my goal, for this year at least. My son had enjoyed the intense battle between mom and cat immensely, giggling the entire time, but we did not have the last laugh over the next few weeks as we were forced to endure hateful glares and an extremely depressed cat who spent the majority of his time lying in the exact same spot where the tree had been. Eventually, he seemed to forget about this major catastrophe, or at least chose to forgive us, as he gradually began to slip back into normal cat mode and found other interests, like pestering us for more attention or bossing the other cats around. When we moved not too long afterward, his attention became focused on the huge changes in our daily schedule. He also no longer had a tree spot to lie on at our new place. Eventually, Christmas rolled around again, and the first part of decorating for the holidays was, of course, the grand entrance of the tree box from the storage shed. Despite the fact that it had been many months and there had been many changes since he'd last seen this box, Zorro's ears perked up and his eyes grew huge as he watched me carry the box into the living room. He sat down nearby to watch the proceedings while my son and I put the tree together and decorated it. When we took a break, Zorro snuck over in his cat-like way and proceeded to examine the tree. The ornaments were of little interest to him, strangely enough. It was the tree that had always intrigued him. Zorro chose a spot underneath the tree and claimed it for his own, lying there while we finished decorating, his face a picture of pure happiness. My son picked him up eagerly from underneath the tree as I added the final decoration, the much-loved and well-worn tree skirt. When the now six-year-old placed him back down on the ground, Zorro ran over to the skirt and promptly curled into a ball, laying his head on the fabric and looking like he had found a lost long family member. From that moment on, he became a permanent Christmas decoration. Whenever I was looking for him, my son would automatically run to the tree to find the soft little Christmas present that was always underneath it. When Christmas passed as swiftly as it always did, the time soon arrived to put away the tree. But when I dragged out the tree box to begin the proceedings, Zorro became almost desperate in his attempts to latch on to the tree and tree skirt. He looked so miserable and pitiful that I did not have the heart to take down the tree and we decided to put the box back into storage and wait for a while. That year, we left the tree up until Easter. Zorro didn't care which holiday it was, though. To him, Christmas was every day that the tree was there. To this sensitive little cat, Christmas was about enjoying the things we have with a fierce intensity that sometimes defies all logic. He reminded us to take a step back and quit rushing through the holidays, something we all tend to do in our hectic lives. It didn't really matter if the tree wasn't put away by New Year's. In fact, it brought so much happiness to one caring heart that having a Christmas tree at Easter made perfect sense to us. Thank you, H.M. Forrest, for that great story. Well, there's a few Christmas cups of chicken soup from the wonderful book series, A Chicken Soup for the Soul, Christmas Edition. I feel all warm and fuzzy inside now. How about you? Like I said in the intro, if you've never read any of the books from the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, I highly recommend picking up one of the titles that really connects with you and give it a read. From the Hockey Journey podcast, online hockey training, my family, and myself, we'd like to wish all of you out there a magical holiday season. Merry Christmas, and I'll see you next time.